Hi, and welcome to Smart Training 365. This is Mol RB, and I'm with the one and only Doug Brignoli. How you doing, Doug? Hey, Mo, good. Thanks. How are you? Doing great. Today, Doug, I'm going to show you a video. I don't know. I think you saw it, you know, but um, in the beginning, I really didn't want to do a video about it because I felt that many of the information that this person was showing or talking about weren't really uh, based on research that he did in depth. It's very shallow. It's kind of amateurish because uh, if you look at the uh, co uh, like comments, you will see like, did this person like really read the book? Does, does he know what's in the online courses or the content, you know? Uh, but then I think um, he represents uh, a mentality or like belief that many people share with him. That's why I think it's better for us to do this video so we can uh, straighten the record and explain what is it really that we mean. So there will be no uh, misunderstanding. You know, everything will, will be crystal clear. And also many people will not be misled with uh, what he said. Uh, because many things are not based on facts. Right. Now, that, the, the fact is that there's a lot of people that, um, that are, um, well, traditionally minded, right? They believe in old school, everything. Uh, and they don't have enough physics information to grasp what we're teaching. Um, and they maybe have a resistance or a refusal to grasp it. And so you're right. We need to address not only, you know, the people that, um, are open-minded, but also the people that are closed-minded and that have, let's say, foolish beliefs or foolish misunderstandings, right. um, not just to, you know, put this person uh, in, in a better understanding of things, but also to let everyone who has similar uh, false beliefs right. to let them be informed as well. Perfect. So thank you for joining us for the video. I hope you will enjoy it. And I'm going to first start showing you like uh, clips and we comment uh, on each point because it's important, in my opinion, to clarify it and stop, you know, and discuss it. Next, he definitely knows his stuff. When it comes to biomechanics, when it comes to physics, when it comes to anatomy, physiology, he definitely knows what he's talking about. And I didn't hear anything at all where I was like, hmm, that's not what that muscle does. Or yeah, he's not quite right on there. He definitely knows his stuff when it comes to the functions and the form of the human body, which is a good thing because a lot of coaches don't really know a lot about that. All right, Doug, you know your stuff. Well, the, <laughs> the first thing I'll say is um, this person, as, as we will show in the rest of this video, does not know his stuff. He does not understand biomechanics. He does not understand physics. He does not actually understand the anatomy. Um, and so, you know, for this guy to give me a compliment and say he really knows his stuff would be like for me to get fashion advice from this guy. Thanks, but no thanks, right? That's not the kind of compliment I want. I want a compliment from someone who really knows physics, who really knows biomechanics, that compliment I'll take. Getting a comment from a guy that is clueless is completely meaningless. He also has a really good latissimus dorsae exercise um, where you're, it's an isolation movement, just pure lat isolation, squeezing down with the elbow and then contracting downwards with the lat. Because as he noted, the lats, you can't fully contract both lats at the same time. It's a bit like your trap because it's connected to your head you can't twist both ways at the same time. Therefore, in order to get a maximum upper trap contraction, it can only really be on one side at a time. Same thing for the lats. If you're doing a pull down bilaterally, there's no way to really get a full contraction. So I think this thing as a sort of assistance exercise or finisher or activation exercise is a really, really good option. <laughs> That's a good option. So the first thing I'll say is that he's completely wrong about shrugs. He's completely wrong about... There's no reason why you have to do one trapezius, upper trapezius at a time. And he says, because it's connected to the head. It's like, okay, I do not recommend tilting your head to one side or the other. That's ridiculous. You can do both shrugs, both shoulders at the same time, perfectly fine. So for him to say that my lat exercise recommending it one arm at a time is good for the same reason, that's a stupid thing. It's for another reason. It's not for the reason he says, and you should not be doing shrugs one shoulder at a time. The reason, and, and by the way, I should also show 
that, you know, this picture right here shows the right way to do the exercise that we recommend, which is the one arm lat pulling. And the reason is because the objective is to pull the muscle insertion toward the muscle origin. As you can see here in the photo, what I'm doing is I'm moving my arm away from the spine in the up swing of the, of the exercise. And then I'm moving my arm, my latissimus insertion toward the midline of my body. And in order to do that, I have to rotate my body toward it. Uh, I could do two arms at a time, but I can't rotate to both sides at the same time. So that's why it is better to do one arm pull in as opposed to two arm. And you can see in his video, he's not even doing that. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not even close to doing it the right way. He's turning his torso and he's making his spine go around the corner from the direction of the resistance. It's supposed to be in line with the direction of resistance. So he doesn't even understand why we recommend a one-arm lat pull-in because he's demonstrating his cluelessness. He says he knows how the anatomy works. No, he does not know how the anatomy works. He actually uh, reminded me of a movement that Jeff Cavalieri from Athlete X was doing. And we were talking about that video that he did the same movement. That's basically the same movement that he showed well, out here. As, as we've explained in the past, the idea is that you want there to be a, a line of force. You want there to be a straight line between the direction of the resistance and the origin of the muscle, or as close to it as possible. Right. The reason why a dumb one arm dumbbell row is typically not good is because the tendency mm -hmm. is to turn your torso, right? And if the origin insertions, excuse me, the origins of the latissimus are on the spine, by rotating your torso, you're moving the insertion away from the line of force. And what is in line with the, uh, the line of force then is the rear deltoid. So when you turn like that, you get far more rear deltoid than anything else. It would be the same thing as me grabbing over there and pulling in this direction instead of pulling in this direction. You want to pull toward the origin of the lats, which is in the lower two thirds of the spine and the, and the upper part of the, uh, of, the, of the pelvis. And the only way you can do that is by having a lateral direction of resistance, not a cross body direction of resistance. Got it. Another good point he made was that load does not equal tension. So just because you're putting more weight on the bar doesn't mean you're putting more tension on the muscle. And in some cases, you might actually be decreasing the tension on the muscle. If the tension is going to other areas or you're using momentum or you're cheating, something like that, more weight could actually be less stress on the muscle. And I think it's a good idea to just view a muscle as a machine. It's just, it's just a piece of rope that can contract, okay? So it's entirely possible to use more weight and to actually get less activation of that muscle. All right, so... <laughs> This is the kind of thing that I'm talking about is, is he talks with a lot of confidence, with a lot of authority, mm -hmm. but without any real information. So um, it is true that you can use a lot of weight and get less load on the muscle, but not for the reason that he mentioned, not because of momentum or because of cheating. He didn't once mention the moment arm, physics, levers. That is the reason why you can use a lot of weight and not get a lot of muscle load. That is also the reason why you can get a lot of muscle load without using a lot of weight because of the moment arm, but he doesn't understand physics. So that's the irony is for him to give me a compliment on Doug really knows his physics is meaningless. He does not know physics. He's not qualified to comment on that. So what I'm going to show you here in this graphic is a scale. Now on the scale, what you're seeing here is uh, on the right side of that, you see a longer lever arm. And on the left of the center, you see a shorter lever arm, right? On the left, on the shorter lever, you can see I've got three of those weights. And on the right, I have one. Yet the one is lower, heavier than the three. Now you might say, well, that's because it's a longer moment. It's a longer lever. Yes, it is because of a longer lever. And that is one of the reasons or one of the factors that determines the moment arm. But it's really about those dotted lines. You see those dotted lines right there? Notice the difference between the dotted lines on the left and the center dotted line and the dotted lines on the right and the dotted lines in the center. Mm -hmm. That distance is called the moment arm. That is what determines load. That is what determines magnification. So in this particular scale illustration, this, the, whatever muscle is going to be using that longer moment arm and lesser weight will get more muscle load will get more resistance than the other side, which has three times more weight, but a shorter moment arm. Okay, now let me show you the next graphic. I created the scale here because now I wanna show you how you can change 
a, a moment arm without changing the length of the lever. Here I've got two six inch levers on a scale. As you can see right there, they're both at the same angle. When you look at them symmetrically like this, right? There's no weight in either basket. Okay, now we're gonna add on this next one, we're gonna add one weight to each side, still balanced, right? The scale is still even. On the next one here, what I'm showing you is I've added a second weight to the left side, right? So that's now tipping the scale to the left. And you can see the distance in the moment arm difference between the left and the right of that center. Yeah. Right? So that means that the lever on the left, that angle of lever, that distance of moment arm from the center with two weights is equivalent to that angle of lever on the right with a lighter weight. Okay, now the next one I'm showing you is three weights on the left, one weight on the right. Notice the difference in the, in the, in the moment arm, the distance between the center and the left and the center and the right. So when we look at that, what that is actually telling us is that three weights with a shorter moment arm is equivalent to one weight with a longer moment arm on the right. And what does that translate to? On this next one, you can see that 30 degree angle lever is what we have when we do a squat on the lower leg. And the one on the right is the angle of the lower leg during a sissy squat. Now it's obviously Tom Platt. So you can see that the guy on the left is using a lot of weight on his back and Tom Platt is using no weight, right? Now, regardless of what the math would be, and we can explain the math in another slide, but what I'm saying here is it takes three times as much weight with a lower leg at a 30 degree angle to get the same amount of quadricep load as you could get with one third the weight and that angle horizontal lower leg. That is the reason, that is the thing that determines muscle load. It is not momentum or cheating. He never once throughout this whole video mentions moment arm mentions anything having to do with levers or mechanics. He does not know. That means he did not read my book. He does not know what we're talking about. He does not get it. He's commenting from a complete place of naivete. He does not know the subject, and yet he thinks that he knows the subject. Yeah, it's uh, like one thing to have the book, and it's another thing to understand the book. When you have it, it doesn't mean that you understand what's in it. Well, I, I would go so far as to say that people like this um, are not looking for information that will be useful to them. What they're looking for is something to criticize. Um, and, and he literally has tried in this video to construe arguments as futilely as he's done that, as, as poorly and illogically and, and with massive you know, gaps of information. He has tried to find fault. And yet he does not know anything about what we're talking about, how it is that lever angle, limb angles affect muscle load, which is our whole program, our whole, co our whole course is dedicated to finding what is better than or worse than what. It is, it is meant for people that want better training, more efficient training, more, more uh, bang for the buck. Look, you know, it, 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 it's not impressive to say I spent this much money on buying a house if you pay too much for the house, right? What you want is value, right? We're trying to teach people how to pay the least for a very valuable home or even a more valuable home than you would have gotten paying more money by using physics, by understanding some basic physics principles. That's what we're about. He's clueless about that. He doesn't understand that's what the goal is. That's what some people want. They don't necessarily want to show off and, 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 and squat 405. That's not the objective of the audience we're talking to. We're, on, we're talking to the people who say, how can I get more muscle load than a 405 uh, barbell squat can give me without straining my body as much, without straining my skeleton as much? Right. And as I said, I don't know when I told you, like, the video is more is about views and create a reaction. That's what I felt. That's why I didn't want to do it yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. But as, I, as we said, like, uh, there are many people who think that way, and it's better to do the video and explain it. It, it is. I agree with you. Well, the, here's the thing is, as you said, there is no direct correlation between strength and size. A lie detector test experiment? That was a lie. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, good. So 
uh, obviously what he's suggesting is that me saying that there's no correlation between strength and size or no direct correlation between strength and size is a lie. Boy, that's offensive. Um, I, I don't take offense because I consider the source. <laughs> it's like the same thing as considering the sorts of taking a compliment about physics. It's like he doesn't have a clue. But what I'm saying is this, is that we all know people, those of you watching, all of us know people who are stronger than they look and people who are bigger than they are as strong as, strong as you think they might be, right? So right here, I'm going to show you a slide. And this guy right here is a friend of mine. His name is Martin Drake. He's bench pressing 297 pounds. His body weight is 160 pounds. Now, if you look at his arms, he's not big. He's not muscular. Now, those of you who are bench pressing, let's say 200 pounds and hoping to bench press 250 or 300, thinking that that is automatically going to give you more muscle, bigger pecs, bigger, bigger arms, just look at that. I mean, that is one example. Here's another example. Martin Drake, same guy, deadlifting, 733 pounds at a body weight of 168. How many of us can, bench, can deadlift 733 pounds? I can tell you right now that I've got a lot more muscle than Martin Drake does, you know, and I can't deadlift 733 pounds. Right? There's a lot of people with a lot of muscle that can't deadlift 700. And there's people that can deadlift 733 pounds and don't have a lot of muscle. There is no direct correlation. Now, is it true that when you challenge a muscle with resistance, that it gains size and strength? Usually, yes, they correlate in that sense. The, is there a direct correlation? In other words, if you are, let's say, curling, let's say, a 90 pound barbell. Do you think that automatically curling, you know, a 95 pound barbell or a 100, that that will automatically make your biceps bigger? Not necessarily, right? So um, the biggest I ever was in competition was at the age of 31 in 1991. And that's not the strongest I was. I was, I probably hit my, my, my plateau in terms of strength two years before that, right? But I was smaller two years before that. So those of us that are physique competitors, bodybuilders, uh, those of us that, are, that, that train um, for the combination of size and strength, but we don't care how our strength level compares to somebody else. We will be stronger just by virtue of lifting weights. We will be stronger just by virtue of challenging the muscles with resistance, obviously, as compared to someone who doesn't challenge their muscles. But but when you go to the gym, you want to work that muscle. You want to focus on the muscle. When I, when I do a set of, let's say, dumbbell press, I try to make the weight I'm using heavier by keeping more distance, lengthening the lever arm, right? Making sure that I don't bring it in close, shortening mm -hmm. the lever arms, right? I'm not trying to lift a heavier weight. I'm trying to work the muscle more. So if the focus is on heavier, 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 you're going to be missing the point if your objective is muscle gain. So that's what I mean by no direct correlation. So it is not a lie. And, 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 and those of us who have been training as I've been training over 40 years, you know, I mean, please, this guy has been training not even half that long, right? He hasn't half the achievements and half the knowledge I have. And he has the audacity to, 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 to say that what I said was a lie. That's just foolish. That's crazy, actually. Another thing that I appreciated is that a few times in these podcasts, he said the words, I don't know. Don't know? And I love it when someone says that because it's being honest and not everyone knows everything. You see some people, they don't have the courage to say those words. I don't know. And I think that should be viewed as a good thing. You can't know everything and trying to like bullshit your way through a question that you don't know often can get you in trouble. So kudos to him for just saying the words, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So take a look at this slide right here. Basically, this is him. <laughs> Open mouth, insert foot. Right? This is him telling me that it's good, telling all of you that it's good to say, I don't know. And yet nowhere in this video does he ever say, I don't know. But as we will continue demonstrating, he doesn't know. He doesn't know that he doesn't know. 
<laughs> that's how far he is from knowing. He, does, he has no clue that he doesn't know. And yet he's complimenting me on being able to having the courage to say that I don't know. And yet he does not only not have the courage to say, I don't know. He doesn't even have the common sense to suspect that he doesn't know. So that's just, <laughs> that's again, like giving me the compliment on physics. It's like, this guy is like so far clueless that it's laughable. I mean, some people will forgive you if right now, because they never heard you cursing, if you right now say, he doesn't know shit, <laughs> they will, they yes, will agree I, with you. know, you. I always try to be polite, but this yeah. guy truly does. And, and I'll tell you what, it's okay to not know shit. It's not okay to pretend you do. It's not okay to, to try to criticize someone who knows from a place where you just are so lacking in awareness that is absolutely laughable yeah we didn't do the video about you you did it about us so right, right now we are dissecting what you're saying and, and by the way what i the other thing i want to say too is and, and, and i'll show you something later throughout the rest of these clips that we're showing you i want you to focus on the discrepancy between his level of confidence his assuredness that what he's saying is correct. In fact, a few times you'll see him being saying something really sarcastically, like "uh, duh," and and yet, how different that is from his level of knowledge. I mean, he's literally in the gutter when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to understanding mechanics or physics. Literally in the gutter, and yet that discrepancy is massive. The confidence versus the actual knowledge is huge. I don't think he's aware of it. Yeah, this is why they call it clueless. <laughs> Okay, now for the bad. Now, the first one was that squats are a bad quad exercise. Now, the first thing I would say, the first thing I would say is that um, squats is a terrible quadricep exercise. And I understand his logic. You're putting a lot of weight, a lot of load, a lot of potential stress on the spine. However, it is almost always well within the loads that a spine can tolerate. And if your technique is good, your odds of getting injured are pretty low. And if you do get injured, it's not necessarily the fact that it was a squat. It was either your technique or not recovering enough or too much volume or some other factor. Just because you get injured doing an exercise, it doesn't mean it's the fault of the exercise. And I understand that he's had some issues with these exercises in the past, but that doesn't mean they're bad exercises. And I think throwing them out just because you personally had a bad experience is not the way to go. And some people do exclusively squats for their quad development and develop very, very impressive, big, succulent, juicy, tender quads. You look at natural hypertrophy, his quad training, Front squats, back squats, pause squats, box squats, safety bar squats. That's about it. I've never seen him do a leg extension or a sissy squat or anything like that. It is exclusively barbell squats. So they work. They fucking work. No doubt about it. They have drawbacks. They have potential issues. But if you solve those issues, which shouldn't be that hard, they work. Do you have anything to say about that? Oh, yeah, of course. He says uh, they have issues. But if you solve those issues, that's fine. Okay. So, again, you know, number one is my issue with squats and it isn't my issue it is the issue it is mechanics right the problem with squats the main problem with squats is not the compression of the spine that's just one added insult to injury right so to speak um, it's one more factor but it's not the, the main reason it is because of physics okay now look at the slide again same slide i showed you before the problem with squats is that degree of tilt of that lower leg lever. The amount of moment arm, the short moment arm from the knee to the foot that determines the percentage of load that goes to your quadricep, the percentage of the weight that you're using, which goes to your quadricep, right? So the problem with squats, number one, is that you have to use a lot of weight in order to get the same amount of load you could get with much less weight and a more horizontal lower leg. That's number one. Number two is because it's a compound exercise, because you are extending the hip joint at the same time, because you're activating the glutes, the hip extensor muscles at the same time, you are shutting off the rectus femoris, which is at least 20% of your quadricep, because it also plays the role of hip flexor. This has been demonstrated in EMG studies. Brad Schoenfeld and Chris Beersley have both. Um, express this in research and, you know, acknowledge it. Now, they don't, ex they don't acknowledge the reason why the rectus femoris is shutting off, but they are recognizing that it does shut off. 
mm-hmm. that, that doing a compound exercise for the quadricep is inadequate. I believe the word is they use to get rectus femoris stimulation, which is part of your, that you have to therefore then do an isolated knee extension exercise, like a leg extension or a sissy squat in order to get the rectus femoris. But when you're doing those isolated exercises, you also get the other three muscles. You don't only get the rectus femoris. So why not only do the the leg extension or the sissy squat? So um, these are the two primary reasons because the muscle stimulation that you get for the amount of investment of weight and effort for the quadricep is severely compromised. Now, we've done some math on this. We've talked about it before. I'm not saying people should squat 200 pounds less or more, but we use 200 pounds uh, barbell squat to do the, to do the analysis, right? Mm-hmm. So if you weigh 200 pounds and you've got a 200 pound bar on your back, that's 400 total pounds. You've got two legs. So let's just divide that between two legs at 200 pounds per leg. What you do then is you take that 200 pounds and you multiply it times the length of the operating lever of the quadricep, which is about 16, I believe we use the number. You can Google this uh, to find the average length tibia. And then you multiply that times the percent between zero and 100, between Mm -hmm. vertical and horizontal, um, which was about 30%. So you can calculate that you're going to get about 950 pounds of load per quadricep with a 200 pound guy doing a 200 pound barbell squat. Now, if you just stop right there, you don't compare it to any other exercise, you could say, great, 950 pounds of load per quadricep is good, right? And if I add more weight, it's more, right? Yes, this is why people develop juicy quads, as he said. I never said, we've never said that squats don't work the quads. That's not the comparison. The comparison, what works better? If a 200 pound guy does a sissy squat with only his body weight, as you can see in that picture there, and he lets his lower leg get horizontal, he will load using the same factors. He will get 1,200 pounds of load on each quadricep. That is more than 950. That is more stimulus for growth, right? And on top of it, it's less, less wasted effort. There is also no compression on the spine. Now, when I do my sissy squats or, and you know, we've a very good way of doing sissy squats is holding some cable resistance from low pulleys. So I typically use about 55 pounds on each side. It's 110 pounds added to my body weight. So now I'm getting much more than 1,200 pounds of load per quadricep. Um, and am I getting some spinal compression? Yes. I'm getting 110 pounds of downward force. Not as much as the 200, not as much as 400, but it's less. So the ratio of benefit to risk is far less. The ratio of benefit to cost is much less. This is what we're talking about. It's not, he completely misses the point and focuses in on like, you know, spinal injury. That's not the main reason squats aren't a good quadruple. quadruple. Do they work? Yeah, they work. It's like taking the roughest, bumpiest road to your destination and thinking that because you got to your destination, that that was a good road to take. It was not the best road to take. There was a better road on the other side. It was smoother. It was drier. You got less wear and tear on your, on your vehicle. That's what we're recommending. He is just, he's just demonstrating with thing after thing, just demonstrating his ignorance. To uh, explain a little bit more about this, when we want to load a muscle, we need a load. Right. right. That's how muscle growth work. You're not right. going to do it like this. So can we all agree that um, in order for muscle to grow, we need to find the best way to load them? Well, if you want to be the idiot who wants to spend three times more effort, incur more risk of injury um, to get the same reward that you could get paying less, go ahead. I'm not saying you're not going to get there. There's lots and lots and lots of evidence that conventional exercises, traditional compound exercises build muscle. They do. I'm not, I, we've never, ever said they don't. Mm-hmm. What we're trying to get at is what is a better way of doing it. And you can calculate that using simple physics. Now, somebody asked me, Mark Bell asked me um, when I did his show, he said, isn't it true that you said that squats works 30% of your quadriceps? I said, that's not what I said. 
Right. What I said is that squats load your quadricep with 30% of the available quote unquote resistance. What is the available resistance? The available resistance is your body weight divided by your limbs, two limbs, and however much weight you're using times the length of the leper that's doing the lifting, which isn't for the quadricep, it's the lower leg times the percentage of activity. So again, if it's horizontal, again, we're talking free weight. When you're talking free weight, horizontal is the biggest moment arm. Getting back to that moment arm, right? Horizontal limbs will give you the biggest moment arm, the biggest magnification. That is the 100% mark. A 30% lever gives you 30% of what it, what it could be, what it would be. If you were able to have that operating limb be horizontal at maximum moment arm length, that's the difference. So why do, it is ridiculous to say, I'm going to take this inefficient lower leg lever and instead of fixing it, instead of making it go more horizontal, instead of de decreasing the degree of inefficiency, I'm going to keep that degree of inefficiency. I'm just going to load it more. I'm going to load more weight on my spine. And then at one point, you know, we may see it later. At one point, he says something like, you know, that Brignoli's got a, a problem with loading the spine, but loading the spine is good for uh, bone density of the spine. Yeah, that's true, right? But first of all, you don't have to load the spine with 400 or 500 pounds of weight, right? I'm loading my spine with 110 pounds of weight when I do my cable sissy squats. I'm also loading my spine when I do my cable shrugs or my dumbbell shrugs with, you know, 80 pound dumbbells. I'm also loading my spine when I carry my 60 pound dumbbells or 70 pound dumbbells to the rack after doing decline dumbbell press. I'm loading my spine every time I weight bear for the most part, right? Now, we're not saying squat or nothing. We're saying squat or other weight bearing exercises that are more efficient. So I, this is taking things out of context. Doug Brignoli has never said, don't do squats because um, it's bad for your spine. Yes, it is potentially bad for the spine. That's true. But it is the fact that you're doing that potential risk for no additional benefit, for less benefit, in fact. That's the reason squats are not a good quad exercise in comparison to better options. It also makes the argument that a sissy squat puts less stress on the joints. And in terms of the spine, absolutely. But again, it's well within the range that the spine can tolerate. Plus, the spine can actually adapt over time. People who lift weights, they have higher bone density in their vertebrae. Straight up dog, straight up dog, straight up dog. And just because something has less weight, that doesn't mean it's less stress on a joint. A lot of people get issues from sissy squats. Even knees over toes guy, when he's talking about a sissy squat, he is very conservative with his recommendations. He says to, you know, start light, start easy, start without that complete range of motion. And if you get any pain, stop doing it. That's because for a lot of people, they do have knee pain with this movement, despite relatively less load. During a squat, the knees are going forward, you're loading the knee, the hips are going backwards and down, you're loading the hips as well as the lower, lower back, but it's in balance. And there's nothing wrong with a compound movement. Just because on paper, in theory, you're not loading the quads as much as you could, relatively speaking, that doesn't mean it's a bad exercise. Straight up dog. You know, I love that straight up dog thing. I mean, that just, that's such an arrogant thing to say. That's just, that just basically says, I am so right by saying this. That's what straight up dog actually means. Like, I, I am so right in saying this. And Doug is so wrong in saying that, you know, putting weight on your spine is bad. Right. And again, I don't say putting weight on your spine is bad. What I say is putting too much weight unnecessarily, unproductively is just not wise. Right. I mean, I, as I said, I, I load my spine when I do shrugs. I load my spine when I do cable squats, cable sissy squats. Right. I, I, I do load my spine. I don't say don't load your spine. Right. OK. Number one. Here's the thing is, um, if you have bad elbows, if you have previously injured elbows, if you have arthritic elbows, you will discover that most, if not all, tricep exercises bother your elbows, okay? That's just because you cannot load your tricep without the tricep tendon that crosses the elbow joint. You need your elbow to work your triceps. You need your knees to work your quadriceps. So getting back to the example I used earlier, let's just say that you're going to compare the way your knee feels with a 200-pound barbell squat versus a bodyweight sissy squat. 
body weight sister squats is going to load your quads with 1200 pounds. 200 pound barbell squat is going to load your, your knees with 950 pounds. Which one of those do you think you're going to feel more in your knees? 1200 pounds of load in your quadricep, right? So the more you load a muscle, the more the joint that is moved by that muscle is going to participate in that activity, right? So um, if you have knee pain, when you do um, squats, you can, by the way, you can get the same 1200 pounds of load on your quadricep doing squats, but you'd have to put a lot more weight on your back right. in order to do it. And by the time you do that much weight on it, then you start to feel it on your knees. If you start to, if you feel the other, so it's the amount of load to the muscle that determines the degree to which that joint is going to participate. If you have bad knees, the more you load the quadricep, the more you feel in your knees, period, right? The idea that your knees are going over your toes, um, and, and, and some people will say, that's why it's bad for you. No, that isn't why. When you let your knees go over your toes, you let your lower leg get more horizontal, right? That's called, we call that perpendicularness, right? The more perpendicular your target, your limb, the limb of your target muscle is to the direction of resistance, the bigger percentage of load you'll get. If you do curls, your form gets perpendicular. Right. When you do skull crushers, your form gets perpendicular to gravity. When you do side raises, your form gets, you need perpendicularness. You need that operating lever to be the most perpendicular it can be with a, 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 a percentage, excuse me, with a, a resistance level that, that allows you to use that perpendicularness and not overload the muscle. So yes, if you, some people who don't have super strong quads cannot get all the way down on a, on a, on a, on a sissy squat, cannot let their, because it's too much load on their quadricep. So don't go that low yet. Start little by little, letting the knees go a little bit farther forward, letting that lower leg get a little more horizontal, you know, progressively, not every single time, but progressively. And the more you do that, the more load you'll get on your quadricep, right? So I agree that you cannot overload the muscle because if you have a bad joint, it'll also be felt in the joint. That, that's true. But his point about, you know, um, <laughs> There's just no comparison. I mean, he just, he's, he never once mentions physics. He never once mentions the moment arm. It's like, it's not everything we talk in. The book is called the physics of resistance exercise, the physics of fitness. That's our course. He never once in any of these criticisms mentions the moment arm. He doesn't even understand it. Well, he mentioned an easier example, knees over toes, to demonstrate that. Needs over toes guys, needs over toes guy is great. I mean, he gets it, right? He understands yeah. it. And yes, he talks about being progressive. Yeah. And, and we, we say the same thing, right? But, but, he, but the one thing that, that's great about needs over toes guy is that he understands there's nothing wrong. And by the way, for those of you trainers who are out there who have told your clients, don't let your knees go over your toes when you're squatting. Let me ask you this. Do you have those people doing planks? Aren't their knees way over their toes then? a lot more over their toes than they would be when you do a squats with the knees going forward? Do you have those people doing side plank? Side plank. Trying to bend your knee sideways, that sideways pressure on your knee. That's okay. But not letting your knees go over your toes when you squat, it just doesn't make any sense. Next, he calls the overhead press unnatural. I mean, you're right. We, we evolved from quadrupeds. We eventually became primates, pushing progressively downward. Mm. Not even an incline angle is a natural movement. Just because a movement is natural or unnatural, that doesn't mean anything. None of his Brig 20 movements, mostly utilizing cables, are natural. You think cavemen had a cable set up in their caves and they're, they're, just, they're getting fucking jacked? No. They did. Well, they didn't really do barbell movements, obviously. They didn't have dumbbells. But to think like you can't do a movement because it's unnatural is actually a little bit hypocritical on his part. Sure, not everyone should overhead press, but to think it's not an effective exercise for the shoulders is pretty ridiculous. And yeah, you might lack mobility and not be able to go overhead, but that's something almost everyone can achieve. All right. Boy, he's so clueless. Um, okay, first of all, let me just say that if, you, if a person were to push a barbell over their head, something's making that barbell go overhead. Right. Muscles are doing that right? So muscles do work, right? So 
again, I've never said that overhead presses don't work your shoulders. They do work your shoulders, just like squats work the quadriceps. Same problem, or actually worse, on overhead press um, because it's an unnatural movement. So the first thing I'll say about his comment about the cables is <laughs> open mouth, insert foot. I mean, when I speak about natural movement, I'm not talking about natural instrument to load the muscle. I'm talking about natural anatomical motion. What was the, what was the human skeleton designed to do? What was the musculoskeletal system? What did it evolve to do? That's the part that we call natural or non-natural. It's not the thing you use for resistance. It's not the cable. It's not the dumbbell. It's not the barbell. It's not anything other than the anatomical motion. So hypocritical, come on. That's number one. Number two is he says most people can move their arm overhead. That's not true. Eric Cressy did a study and found that more than 50% of all the people who they studied were not able to get their arm rotated far back enough to do an overhead press safely. What does enough mean? Enough means that you have to have enough shoulder mobility to allow your forearm to be completely vertical before pushing up. And, and by the way, that should not be the maximum external rotation. You should still be able to have enough room on the other side so that you are not maximally externally rotating that humerus just to do the overhead press. That's number one. More than 50% of the people cannot do that. They have a slight forward tilt to their forearm, right? Which means they're going like this. What well, that means that this lever, this forearm wants to fall forward. And you have to fight to keep it from happening. And the external rotator that does that is called the infraspinatus. Now, the infraspinatus is much st less strong than the deltoids are. So number one, it's very easy to overload the infraspinatus. And number two is that position, um, as compared to this position, causes the infraspinatus to pull on that humerus from a mechanical disadvantage. What does that mean? Let's just say you're going to do an external rotation down here. That um, infraspinatus starts on the inside of your shoulder blade, goes across your shoulder blade, wraps around the humeral head, and when it contracts, it rotates that humerus toward the insertion of the infraspinatus on the inside part of the scapula. When you put your arm up like this, you're now rotating it this way, not this way, right? So you're asking this muscle to pull from over here and cause a rotation that goes this way. Mm -hmm. That means that this muscle has to pull a whole lot harder, nine, 10 times harder in order to get this thing to rotate this way because it can't pull from over here. It's got to pull from over here, right? So that's how you strain the infraspinatus. And that's why a lot of people, you know, they have, a lot of people have, they left weights have shoulder pain and they don't know why, right? And the, the truth is that they might be doing four or five different exercises that are straining the infraspinatus. Um, and they don't know what to blame. And sometimes they try working their rotator cuff, like that's going to fix it. But the problem is it's already strained, right? So exercising a muscle that's strained is not likely to heal it, right? So um, the other problem with an overhead press is that getting back to this issue of line of force, whichever muscle is directly opposite the mm -hmm. direction of resistance will be the most loaded, right? So when you take your arm and you rotate it, let me see if I can do this. Here's my, here's my side delta. Here's the division between the front delta and the side delta. When I do this, in order to get into an overhead press position, you can see the side delta rotating to the rear, which means it's no longer opposite gravity, right? right? And the front delta has now gravitated more to a position opposite gravity, which means that, in fact, you will get more front deltoid loading on an overhead press than you will side deltoid loading. So if you're doing it for side deltoid, right away, you're losing efficiency. You're losing a huge percentage of the loading because it's not opposite resistance. And then you might say, well, but that's okay because I want to work my front deltoid too. And I would say, yeah, but do you need to strain your, your, your infraspinatus in order to do it? Do you need to cause impingement syndrome, which is the, the squeezing of the lining, excuse me, the squeezing of the tendon of yeah. the supraspinatus? And the uh, subacromial bursa, that's generally what happens. Look up, if you want, um, impingement syndrome. If you 
push that humerus up underneath that acromion process over and over again with weight, there's a significant chance that you will either inflame or rupture the supraspinatus tendon and the subacromial bursa. And you're doing this to get this diminished benefit on the side deltoid and, and, and no more benefit than you would get by doing a safer front deltoid exercise, a better, more direct front deltoid exercise. So it's just not a wise exercise. It's, it has a high degree of risk and it's got a low degree of benefit. So why do it? Is Just because it's a traditional exercise doesn't mean that it's automatically beneficial. What we do is we analyze what is what each muscle is doing and then compare that to other options and decide what is better, what is worse, and what is the most intelligent, what is the most efficient way to train when the objective is muscle loading and muscle development. And uh, I don't think he knows uh, enough about the Brick 20 movement, but the Brick 20 movement include uh, body weight exercises, include dumbbells, include bar, uh, bar uh, include cables. So it's a combination of different things and sometimes um, there are alternatives that require different instruments. So it's not only that. Listen, you know, I, <laughs> I would love to see a conversation between this guy and the, the person who endorsed my book, Robert Eckhart, who's the PhD professor of paleoanthropology, who's basically a forensic scientist. These people study the anatomy and they, they determine what our ancestors had to do and why our body evolved the way it evolved. Why our musculoskeletal system evolved the way it evolved. What was it designed to do? What did it adapt to do? Now, someone can say, we have a, what about climbing trees and what about pulling down fruit? Well, pulling is different than pushing, right? When you're pulling, right, that resistance is pulling you up, which means it's helping your scapula slide upward, right? And as your scapula moves upward, it creates clearance for your humerus to rise up. But when you're doing weight that's pushing down on that scapula and you're pushing up against a scapula that's, that's being held down, now you are far more likely to cause pinching, impingement of that, those tissues in between there, right? So they are not similar movements at all. And, and listen, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that there's no reason a caveman would have ever had to push something vertically, directly over his head, over and over and over again. Did he throw things in a forward direction? Sure. Did he grab things and pull them down? Sure. But the idea that you would go vertical, straight up over your head, repeatedly, what? there weren't shelves there on which to put boxes, right? And and even if there were, I mean, you you wouldn't know. You, maybe you do it one time. You don't do it over and over again. And you don't put, I mean, usually shelves are not directly over your head. They're slightly in front of you. Right. 